Hello, and welcome to Nothing Ever Happens in Canada, and I'm Canadian Girl. Thanks for joining me today. This is a Canadian podcast about the myths, legends, and good old tales Canada has to tell. Have you ever wanted to go on a grand adventure? See parts of the world you never imagined you'd see before? Maybe even discover some gold while you're there? That's exactly how Kate Ryan felt, and that's exactly how she lived. This week, we're going to look at Klondike Kate, a nurse, an entrepreneur, a gold prospector, and the first woman to become an RCMP officer for the Northwest Mounted Police. Join me now as we travel along with Klondike Kate and her many accomplishments. Catherine Ryan would be born on August 20th, 1869, in a small Irish community known as Johnsville in New Brunswick. It is located about 150 kilometers northwest of Fredericton. She was not born into a wealthy family, but a happy one. She enjoyed her days at school and had a happy childhood. It is said she got her love of adventure from her father. In 1893, the family received word that a family member was very ill in Seattle, Washington, and needed assistance. Kate would pack her bags, board a train, and never look back at New Brunswick again. Seattle would change her life. For this small-town girl from New Brunswick, known only as Kate Ryan for now, she was overwhelmed by her senses, by the sights, the sounds, the magic of living in a port city, and seeing all different faces, everywhere, all the time, was something small-town Kate was not accustomed to just yet. She was intrigued by all that she saw, and tried to just take it all in. Horses, horse-drawn carriages, all in the streets, vendors, markets, full of smells and colors she had not seen or smelled before. Once her cousin recovered, She enrolled in nursing school at Nahomish Hospital in Washington. She was a natural at it. Two years later, she would graduate. Her wandering soul would take her to Vancouver. Friends from Johnville, New Brunswick, had moved out west and invited her to join them. In the end, it was the mountains that convinced Kate to go. While living in Vancouver, Kate fell in love with all the nature that surrounded her, and most notably, the mountains. She spent a lot of time hiking through the mountains. She wanted to know what secrets they were hiding. Her fascination with them grew, and she began to meditate on the mountains. She is quoted as saying, I hunger to make my abode where the works of nature, not men, are abound. On August 17, 1896, the Klondike Gold Rush would begin. Three men were panning at Rabbit Creek. Today, this is known as Bonanza Creek. The location is close to Dawson City, Yukon. This was the Gold Rush City capital. It said, a nugget the size of one man's thumb is what started this rush. News quickly spread from newspapers, to cities, to small towns, and right into the ear of our very own Kate Ryan, thanks to a newspaper boy yelling out the headlines one sunny morning in Vancouver, which if you know Vancouver is a rarity in itself. Kate would freeze in her tracks on her way to work that morning after hearing the news. In the weeks ahead, she would make a bunch of decisions that would lead to her becoming Klondike Kate. (music) 
On February 28, in 1898, on a very cold winter's day, Kate would step aboard a steamer at 28 years old and leave Vancouver. This was seen as a very bold move for a single woman of her age at the time. The steamer would take Kate and others right to Wrangell, Alaska. This was a boom city during the gold rush. It would drop them off at what used to be a steamship stop was now nothing more but a mud hole where the Stikine River route to the Klondike would begin, a journey that a hundred thousand people, mostly men, would attempt, but only thirty to forty thousand would ever make it to the actual Klondike. Kate Ryan was one of those people. She would purchase her equipment from the Hudson Bay Company, a tent, a kettle, blankets, shovels, tools, and all other supplies she would need for what she herself would call her great journey. Prospectors had to follow strict guidelines in order to travel on the Klondike Gold Rush trails. Checkpoints would be set up by the Northwest Mounted Police along the trails, monitoring that all prospectors traveling the route would have enough supplies to last one year to prevent their own misfortune. Criminals were denied entry and were forced to turn around. For the most part, the Klondike Gold Rush is said to have been orderly and had very low crime. Once the rivers were frozen solid, new parts of the route were now accessible. Temperatures were brutally cold at times. Snow was claimed to be as deep as 10 feet. Kate would meet a young police officer along the trail whose elected duty within his group was to cook, but unfortunately, George Commerce had no cooking skills at all. Fortunately for him, he had met Kate. Kate gladly took over cooking for him, and out of respect and generosity, his commanding officer would offer Kate a place to stay with them. She would travel with them so far upriver, and once the Northwest Mounted Police stopped to set up a permanent camp, Kate would continue on. Most people headed along the popular Chillicoot Trail from Skagway, Alaska, but not Kate. She would travel the less traveled route. She was a single woman, traveling alone, a mystery to most that she would run into on the trail. But in the end, they all had the same goal, to get to the Klondike. And the next step in that great journey, as Kate would call it, was to get to Glenora. Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier had promised he would build a train coming into Glenora to take them right to the heart of the gold. The tiny little settlement of about a dozen people became 3,000 overnight. Kate would stay that summer in Glenora and open up her first restaurant. When no construction was being done on the rails, Kate and others realized that it was time to pack up and move on. From Glenora, she would head northeast to Telegraph Creek by horseback, about 18 kilometers. She traveled along the Stikine River until it became too dangerous, and then she began to use the Teslin Trail. The Teslin Trail would take her right into the Yukon. She had a pack of horses with her. She would get up at 3 a.m., eat her breakfast, feed her horses, and repack her horses for the day and be on the trail by 5 a.m. She tended to her horses day after day, and she never complained. She remained cheerful, kind, and throughout her journey, those who met her always said she was in great spirits. Kate would arrive in Teslin City, the next big boom town in the Yukon, thanks to the promise of transportation arriving once again. Kate would set up a tent, put her sign out front, and the kitchen was open. This time, though, 
The belief in transportation arriving faded fast. Kate and the others began to pack up. She would trade her horses for a dog sled and a dog team, a smart trade for this lag of the trail. On the Teslin Trail, Kate would work as a nurse, tending to those who were wounded. She found her skills were much in demand along the trail as life was hard and injuries were common. She was only taking money from those who could afford it. While working along the Teslin Trail, Kate would receive word from a friend she made in Glenora. Minister John Pringle would send word that her skills were very much needed in Atlin, B.C., a camp about a hundred kilometers away. It also included a promise that the young messenger would guide her and her supplies over the harsh mountain pass in November. After a brutal five-day trip, Kate found herself in Atlin, B.C. for the winter of 1898. Temps were as cold as minus 60 degrees at times. Side note, I looked up the coldest temp ever recorded in Canada. It is 63 degrees, sorry, minus 63 degrees in Snag, Yukon. So you could say that Kate had some pretty cold days in Atlin, B.C., Unsurprisingly, this was not a winter Kate enjoyed. It was described as being unforgiving and brutal. Many would suffer scurvy, frostbite, and malnutrition that winter. Atlin had only a few long buildings and about a dozen tents at the time. Kate would set up camp next to the nursing station. She would again start a restaurant up in a 12-foot by 14-foot canvas tent with a driftwood floor. It was an instant success. To boost everybody's spirits, Kate would organize a Christmas dinner for all. Everybody donated what they could spare. And even Kate would part with her last six potatoes that her father had sent to her for a gift. When spring finally came that year, the rays of sun were such a relief to all. It had been a very long, hard winter. The gold rush would immediately resume. The melting of the snow and the moving around of earth was a prospector's dream. Everyone began to pack up. They would move on, and Kate would head across Atlin Lake to Taku, about 11 kilometers away then another 40 kilometers to Taku Arm. Today, this is Tangish Lake. Finally crossing into the Yukon and getting closer and closer to her destination, Kate would travel another 42 kilometers and arrive at Nares Lake. She would then travel another 4 kilometers to Caribou Crossing. Today, this is Car Crossing. Kate was growing more exhausted by the day, but her dreams of reaching the Klondike were so close. In fact, they were only about 72 kilometers away, and after everything Kate had been through, 73 kilometers was nothing. After a very rough voyage to Alaska on a steamer, and very difficult months spent on the trails and mountain passes of BC and the Yukon interior, the adventurer, the traveler, the nurse, the restaurant owner, and that small town girl had completed her 800 kilometer great journey, and finally Kate Ryan would stand on a ridge and look down at her destiny. Her goal, her greatest achievement to date, White Horse. She had made it to the Klondike. She was about to become Klondike Kate. The city below was full of tents and people scurrying about in all directions. Now that she had reached her goal, she had to start making a living. She began to brew a pot of coffee right away, and again, a sign would go out front. This time it read, Kate's Cafe. 
open for business. Word spread quickly of the cafe and that Kate had made the journey. Friends she had made in Glenora, Telegraph Creek, even Atlin and more came to congratulate her and hear of her achievements. She was quickly becoming a popular figure in town and she was affectionately becoming known as Klondike Kate in honor of her great journey. She was generous, kind, and the novelty alone that she had traveled the Klondike as a single woman made her famous. She was a favorite in town and a well-known personality. She lived in her tent for two years and ran Kate's Cafe until she herself and her business outgrew it. Kate had her mind set on a house. She would build it all on her own and it would become one of the first framed houses in Whitehorse. Even after moving her cafe to her new home, the cafe's popularity had outgrown it within months. A local hotel owner would offer her some space at his location. The deal was exactly what Kate needed and she took it. Not only did Kate run her cafe, she would patch up the wounded, look after people's washing, provide small loans to miners, and she invested wisely. She would in turn use the money she earned and invested in the Whitehorse community. A well-known donation of hers is to the Catholic church that was built in the area. In 1900, Kate Ryan would be approached by the Northwest Mounted Police. She had the reputation of being a fair and honest person and many other values that the force appreciated. She was hired as a constable special, mainly to deal with the female prisoners in Lowstown, which was located near Dawson City, but also to deal with the female prisoners in the White Horse Jail. Kate was used to apprehend, manage, and search females along with female gold smugglers. She was the first female to be hired by the Northwest Mounted Police. Today they are known as the RCMP. Klondike Kate had become so famous even a couple females tried to steal her name and personality. One, Kathleen Johnson, she was married to a famous film producer and was using the stage name Klondike Kate to perform in theaters. Another, not-so-innocent admirer, was once arrested in Lowstown in 1902, where the tales of the famous Klondike Kate are told. Though Kitty was never arrested by Kate herself, she did decide to borrow her name and story. Kitty Johnson was a known petty thief, dancer, and prostitute. The newspapers went crazy with the stories they were hearing of Klondike Kate. Word of Klondike Kate's behavior got back to her commanding officer. When all was explained, he understood. There was not much you could do. That's the price of fame. She was fearful that her family's reputation may be ruined. But in the end, our Canadian hero, Klondike Kate Ryan, the one and only stands out in the end. Her great journey is much more memorable than any dance or petty thief. Kate Ryan would continue to live in Whitehorse for many years, prospecting gold and helping the Northwest Mounted Police, and also raising her brother's two sons. In 1919, Kate would retire from the Klondike lifestyle and move to Stewart, B.C. The mountains were calling her, and she went. Once again, Kate was surrounded by mountains, and she was finally home. In 1923, she would go back to Johnville, New Brunswick for one last visit, where she was celebrated as a hero. In 1932, in Vancouver, she would pass away surrounded by her beloved mountains. She was laid to rest where she could see them. She never married, nor had any children. 
but they say her spirit lives on in the many lives she touched, and it lingers on the many mountain trails guiding hikers today. The creek behind her house in Stewart, B.C., is named the Kate Ryan's Brook by the local children. Well, that certainly was a great journey. And Klondike Kate Ryan, Canada is grateful for all that you did and continue to do for us in spirit. Your sense of adventure, determination, generosity, independence, entrepreneur skills, and your kind heart and overall cheerful personality, no matter what the circumstance, is an inspiration to all of us. We all need to be a little more like Klondike Kate Ryan this holiday season and all year round. That's it for this Canadian girl. I hope you enjoyed this amazing tale, and I hope you enjoy your holiday season. I'll be back in the new year with a new story to tell. Until then, be good. Santa is still watching for a few more days. I'm Canadian Girl. Until next year. support the show? You can do that in three simple ways. The first one, you can leave us a shiny five-star review on Apple Podcasts. This small gesture means so much to this podcast as it allows us to move around on the podcast charts and meet more awesome listeners like you. The second, you can stop by our souvenir shop and pick up a souvenir from one of our great adventures and take it on your very own. There's t-shirts, water bottles, notebooks, and so much more. Do head over to our souvenir shop today and grab some adventure gear. And finally, the third way you can help support the show is by donation. We have a fancy PayPal button that can be found on the top right of our webpage, nothingcanada.com. This button allows you the option to donate as much as you want, whenever you want. All donations will be used for the channel by buying new books for research, paying for the podcast website, and upgrading equipment. All three links to help support the show, of course, can be found in the show notes below. I thank you all so much for your support of the show. It means the world to me.